So why do you think Jubilee was so successful? I mean, 5 billion views. So the idea was, okay, how do we build something like Disney for digital? I built the business of Jubilee, large media company, 10 million subscribers, a figure year business. How did you guys make money? It was majority. That was a big part of our business, pretty profitable. As far as what makes it successful? The secret formula. The secret formula, yeah. I mean, Mr. Beast tried to poach half your team. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Getting good talent is really hard. The best hires we've ever made, and this is what I recommend to, to most people, is we, we hired... So why do you think Jubilee was so successful? I mean, 5 billion views, and then I think you said 10 million subs, but I think it's 14 million with like total. all the things combined. Yeah, because we also yeah. have... So 14 million followers total, but because you know we're on Snapchat, like we have shows on Snapchat, Got we it. have it's Facebook, you know, TikTok, etc. But... We have two, so two brands. One is the Jubilee main brand, and the other is Nectar, which is our, we spun off our love content, and that lives on on YouTube as well. So combined, in, combined on YouTube, it's ten million subscribers. Jubilee main channel has about nine. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as what makes it successful, yeah, um, the secret formula. The secret formula, yeah. I mean, it's I think easier in in retrospect, like. To be frank, we didn't exactly know what we were doing, but there were there were hunches we had on what would make really strong content. To start, we were mission oriented, right? About how do we bring people together? How do we try to understand people way deeper than you know at a shallow from a shallow perspective, and people who are different than us? So the idea was like how what, there's two two things two theses we had. One is we were looking at a lot of our friends who were creators, who were, you know, YouTubers, and the vast majority of them were either burnt out or uh, just kind of fell out of favor or just kind of dying as a rel from from a relevance perspective. So the idea was, okay, how do we build something like Disney for digital, where it's not really about us; it's about the concepts, the ideas, the stories. That, that we invite people into. So we were one of the first to really think about formats, not about YouTubers or you know talents or whatever it is. So I'd say I'd say that from a longevity perspective is sort of the baseline. It's like what we were creating is way was way bigger than like who we were behind the scenes. It's about the the the, the formats, the um, concepts that can live for, forever without us. So that's like baseline and then the rest came down to understanding like w what gets people so compelled to want to watch content and and stay like for the whole thing and at that point it it, it you know it can really be narrowed down into like stakes like high stakes is very important for us emotional stakes if you think about what people what draws people in to click into a video and what keeps people watching for a long time in a video, it's all emotion. Mm -hmm. So we spent a lot of time on, and I still do today, of like emotion mapping and like how do we elicit a strong emotion as quickly as possible. Um, so a lot of, I would say a lot of what we what we did was develop formats that were kind of like social experiments that have this like, you know, sometimes cringe factor and like how is this gonna play out? And oh, I can't believe they even did that. Um, and and that were novel for for the for the time um, on on YouTube, so people were just really compelled to to watch and see how they would play out. What would be like an example of uh, eliciting an emotional response really quickly? Yeah, so I'd say from a packaging perspective, like, and pa by packaging I mean like thumbnail and title. I would say, uh, you know, one of one of the mo more viral videos we we've made. Um, so I'll I'll do playful and then I'll do a little bit more serious. So one of the more interesting um, shows we have is called Versus One, where we wanted to sort of explore modern dating, like put it under a magnifying glass. Mm. And so the idea was like, okay, people are kind of pissed with Tinder, Bumble, et cetera. How do we explore that? Um, and the, the idea was like, okay, well, what if we bring Tinder to life essentially, and you um, have a contestant or whatever you, you know, want to call them and have just the Tinder experience, but in real life, where they they are swiping people uh, to their face and having to explain their rationale behind like why they why they swipe them, and so what we did is we had this like visual of a huge stack, like a huge line of 
let's call it, you know, females standing up against th- this guy who's got his hand up ready to like swipe left or right. And instantly, you know, it's called like Tinder in real life or, you know, 30 versus one dating app in real life. That is like the, the, the clear, super clear visual representation of like what's going to happen here. And it also looks and feels epic. You're like, holy crap, like he's going to be, what's he going to be? Like his hands ready to swipe them. Mm-hmm. He's got this giant line of, of people up, up in front of his face. And then immediately in, the sh- in, in like the hook, we've got this upbeat, you know, upbeat sort of like tense music going. We've got the girls walking out and the guys like literally like holy. And he's like, like you know, you can see him like sweating bullets. Um, and so you've got the, you, you, you build the stakes yep. um, and then you, f- and you sort of structure the, the format so that stakes continue where we also are alluding to the fact that the girls are going to rate him, like whether they want to even, you know, date, date him oh, it as goes well. Both ways. It goes both ways. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, I think it's just, and this is now, I think the biggest lesson of, of all from, from Jubilee, because we've made, I'd say the vast majority of the shows we've made have failed. Um, and, and one of the biggest lessons that my takeaway was it doesn't really matter how good of an idea you think you have. It truly matters how crystal clear that idea is as quickly as possible. Mm. Like how, how simple can you present a concept from a packaging, a thumbnail and title perspective, and then like immediately in the the hook, like why someone has to watch this. Because you can only hold them for so long. You can only hold it for so long. I mean, yeah. yeah, everyone you should just assume that everyone's looking for a reason to leave. And so how do you combat that by giving them plenty of reasons to stay? Uh then the starts with the click and you know, ends with the payoff at the end. So designing it for there to be a payoff in the end. So that was one, you know, the more playful thing. Then we have um middle middle ground, which is our more um serious, super empathy focused show. It's like are one of our most viral videos as well. We went to we went to Jerusalem and we filmed like you know Palestinians and Israelis coming together. Can they see eye to eye? Super like emotionally powerful, high stakes. Like you know, like I can't believe they did that kind of kind of thing. Um, and so every in everything we do, that's the goal. Is like whew, you know, this is going to be. I, I have to watch this. It's going to yep. be crazy. Um, so uh, hopefully that's helpful. So for each video that you do. And then we'll, I want to come to the business side in a second too. Yeah. For each video that you do, how much time? Like, if you were looking at it from a, looking at it from a percentage basis, how much time goes into the creative ideation mm-hmm. versus production? Yeah, I would say so. And this is something we can talk about now. But like uh, prior, I borrowed a little bit from like tech experience. I sort of br- uh, brought this like hackathon model where it's like you know in a very short period of time. How do we generate a ton of ideas mm. and test them rapidly? So actually, I would say, even though ideas are super important, collectively, I think the ideation piece probably accounts for mm, yeah, like 20, 20%. May, yeah, 20% because we would also develop the ideas even further. But um, then it moves very quickly into testing the idea as simply and as cheaply as possible so we have this like you know we make these mvp truly like a tech sort of model like do the hackathon end with a mvp that can be made in a day or two does it feel like something's there if so move it to pilot Mm. and once it's been greenlit and moved moved into pilot is when all the pre-production work starts and that's actually i would say the vast majority of the work so Mm. for us being format driven a lot of the investment is in casting like who are the people you're bringing in? Do yeah. they have great stories? Are they articulate? Is this going to be a good blend of people? Like from a, ca- a diversity of thought perspective. Yeah. Um, so casting is super important, and pre-production and like show structure and all that stuff is super important. Oh, got it. Yeah, I mean, this is a lot. The creative piece is a lot bigger because you guys are doing formats, Correct. and each format doesn't just go once. How, it's yeah. like a season. It right? is a season, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we are we're, um, for most of our shows, we're like on season, you know, seven or eight, right? Yeah. Um, and so. I think the important thing is to, you know, this is what I continue to recommend to to everyone I work with is like, just just because you've cracked a format um, does not mean like you're you're set. Like you sh- you shouldn't rest on your laurels and be like, okay, cool, like I figured out what the world wants. Formats die. Like for you know, 
as you, we were talking about beforehand, like even Mr. Beast is like, oh, I got to change how I am thinking about storytelling and what these videos look like. And massive sort of tide shifts happen. And so you have to constantly experiment as well. And that's what I was saying is like the vast majority of the things we tried at Jubilee failed. The 20, 30 percent, maybe less uh, of the shows that we piloted, like there was a point in time we were piloting a new show every like three and a half weeks, brand new show. Um, and 80, you know, vast majority of them failed. Yeah. It's just the one or two that popped that real like made all the difference. Yeah. Um, if we weren't experimenting that much, I don't, I don't think Jubilee would be what it is today. Would you say like 90% failure rate on shows? Um, it's almost like running a CRO it's close. test. It's close. 80, yeah. 80 to 90%. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. That's so interesting. That's like uh, hitting a set in poker. That's like um, running a online marketing That's experiment. Right. It's all like 10% it's usually true. that ends up working out. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. For us, we were always like, how do we, and we never got there, but we would always be talking about like batting averages. We'd be like, yeah. okay, what's a real, like, you know, batting 200 or batting 300. Like that's the best we can ask for. Yeah. Um, but we just need, we would always talk about it in like baseball terms, like just need as many at-bats as possible Got it. Um, yeah. to see what what sticks. It's very much like that in, in like with all the short form stuff. It's just like, that's just number of at-bats that you get because oh, you just don't know what's going to hit. Especially short form, yeah. 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 Um, Mr. Beast tried to poach half your team. <laughs> so what happened there? Yeah, yeah. So we were talking about this a little bit beforehand, but like in, in this space, talent is really the biggest bo bottleneck in scaling out content distribution like getting good talent is really hard and so when you look at teams that are doing things right oftentimes the first you know your first reaction is like well let's just you know grab from that team i um, mean it's, it's not like we haven't done anything similar where we'll look at people or, or or folks who are doing things that we respect and see if they want to work with us but yeah he definitely there was like a, an all-out um you know, getting a DM from, from Mr. Beast Instagram is like not nothing. And so he just sent up, like, like hit up all of our creative team. It's like, Hey, you want to, you want to hop on a chat? Um, so he's, he was successful with, I think either two, uh, definitely two, maybe three, uh, folk pulling folks from, from our, our team. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of folks actually, I think he would have been more su successful if, if moving to North Carolina was not a requirement mm. but yeah it, it he, because he's so format oriented because he's all about virality and now creating like an impact and it, that's kind of was our whole ethos so having great storytellers that are primed to think about strong formats and, and storytelling on digital is a leg up and i think that's what he wanted was was pulling people from our team for that Got reason yeah. yeah i mean obviously usually people look to pull like one or two badasses from a company but right. he's looking to pull all of your people yeah i mean i don't know if i don't know if he was going to hire all of them but it definitely wanted to talk to all of them right mm -hmm. um and maybe sniff out his favorite but uh he yeah the 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 people he did to take were were good were good people so yeah um so yeah. what is the secret then? I guess for for you guys, because like you know, you mentioned the, the couple keywords here, so creative storytelling yes. and everything, and it's not easy. And talking about going yeah. viral, like there's there's a whole formula to all this, and you figured it out, right? Yeah. So what what is it um, that made your people special? And like, did you train them up? Like, what mm -hmm. did you do? Yeah. So we we tried a few things where it's like, who, do, what type of characteristics are we looking for? Like, what experience should they have? And Honestly, the the best hires we've ever made, and this is what I recommend to to most people, is we we hired so like film school grads who were amazing narrative like story um, storytellers that had absolutely no experience with digital. In fact, our, some of our best creatives like like di didn't really even watch YouTube at all. Like you know, I'd be, I'd be talking to them about like examples, and they just like never seen any of them. Um, and so. Taking someone who's a really strong creative storyteller, ideator, et cetera, and teaching them the, the the sort of sandbox rules of digital is far more successful and far easier than getting like someone there's like you know a million YouTube strategists and like people who are obsessed with YouTube. It's way harder to do the reverse of like getting someone who gets digital but trying to teach them storytelling. Right. So it takes a little bit of work, but by far the best um, success we've had is just amazing creatives, yeah. storytellers who 
frankly don't even know anything about digital. So where, where do you find these storytellers from, right? Because well, you know what's interesting to me, going yeah. back to Mr. Beast for a second, it's it's he's reversing now in terms of like the the mm. super fast cuts and everything. Yeah. It's like now it's a longer drawn out video. There's storytelling, there's character building and everything. Yeah. But where do you go to find these storytellers, right? Because it's like yeah. it's it's like I think everyone's starting to warm up to the fact that like that's what real marketing is. Yeah, it's true. It is true. Um, I think for it's is very so. Film school is where most of our of our uh, you know hires came from, but it's it's not as simple as that. Um, like our creative director, who's I'm still working with him to help vet creative talent. It's it's like a, obsessing over their portfolio. So vetting creatives by just looking at what they've made and how much like heart and soul went into their went into their pieces. How how much were you moved? by their piece like were they effective in storytelling historically and with what they've made um so generally it's like uh once we have one or two really talented storytellers then it becomes actually all about actually who they know and who they recommend so i'd say your first like one or two is the hardest and that's like turning over every rock going to like you know all the film schools and L- i mean it could be anywhere but mm-hmm. all the film schools in la and talking to professors students who do they recommend and then just obsessing over their portfolio and seeing who's made stories that actually move you. Right. Um, who's and been there, done that. Who's been there, done that, uh, at least on storytelling. And then my job is to train them on the digital aspect. Mm. So you're a great storyteller. How do you package that up to crush it on YouTube or crush it Got on it. TikTok? Um, so that's how we do it. it. Yeah, so what I'm hearing here is you're hiring people that have been there, done that with storytelling and then training them on the facets around how YouTube works, how yes. digital works and everything. So then you don't have to train them from scratch on storytelling because that's arguably harder to way do. Harder. Yeah. Way harder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like, in fact, we were testing this at some point. It's like, well, maybe we should just hire like a creative who we don't, you know, like their portfolio isn't anything special, but they're just like obsessed with YouTube mm-hmm. um, and they get it and they like are a huge consumer and it, it just it it om- it almost never worked. Yeah, because um, the people that are obsessed with YouTube, it's like yes, average view duration, thirty second retention, the yeah. click through rates, and everything. Yes. But that's not storytelling. It's not. You're right. Yeah, exactly. It's it, yeah. It's just way easier to be like, okay, you you can tell a really good story. Well, this is what like this is the the sort of framework to f- sort of you know the lens to sort of put that through as far as as far as YouTube mm-hmm. goes. So yeah, that worked way better got us yeah i wanted to take a second to talk about today's sponsor Ahrefs. Ahrefs is my favorite seo tool in fact we use it at my ad agency single brain for internal uses and also for clients and we've been using it for years and years and the cool thing is they have a great academy that you can go to if you're looking to just learn seo and they have a free offering if you just search for ahrefs.com slash webmaster dash tools my favorite feature with Ahrefs, it's a sneaky feature here but i'm just looking at zapier.com and what I'm doing is I'm looking at, oh, wow, they, they got 10 million visits in the last, I don't know, six months or so compared to the previous six months. Well, okay, how are they doing it? I can look at their site structure. So if I click on site structure, I can see that their blog has driven the vast majority of it. And it was a five million, a plus five million change, right? So basically what I can do is I can look at the pages that are driving that traffic. And now I have a sense for what they're doing in terms of strategy. So I can look at competitors. I can also look at our own stuff too, to figure out how we can optimize our own website. So you can just check out Ahrefs Webmaster Tools. That's completely free. Or you can go to the Ahrefs Academy. That's also free as well to learn more. And that being said, back to the video. Um, so Jubilee, I mean, the, the business of Jubilee, like how did you guys make money? Yeah. I mean, it's, it was a media company, so it, it was majority advertising. Uh-huh. So, you know, platform ads accounted for a lot. And we were lucky in that the content is viral on, you know, almost every platform we put it on. So yeah. YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat were a big driver of, of the business. And then we yeah. had a... So I like I, I built out our our sales team. So we had a biz dev working actively with advertisers, partners, sponsors to get them integrated into our content. Yeah, um, so that was a big part of our business. Pretty profitable. Um, I'd say collectively that was the vast majority of our of our business. But then we also had um, we had product. So we would sell. Um, we had an apparel line. We have a a card game based on one of our shows. Um, uh, but film and TV was a uh, probably our newest, but 
sizable size of our of our business. Mm -hmm. It's like what who are the streamers, who are the networks we can partner with to take some of this format development to them to yeah. Hollywood. Um, and then the the one that we're building out, you know, Jubilee is building out now is uh, tech. So tech and experiences to follow, which is love is is still a big like interest and passion for for Jubilee when it comes to like human relationships and depth of relationship. Like there's nothing more deep than than love, and there's just very low like the NPS score of all the sort of dating you know services apps is extremely low. And so our idea was like, how do we make the next generation sort of love ecosystem? Starting with content, we launched a, um, a sort of assessment digital platform, pushed that through the content, already have like a million a million users for that. And then it's what's the long like how do we you know compete? At, at a big at a bigger scale, right. and you said a million users for what? So there's, we started with uh, it's almost like a Myers Briggs okay. ass assessment. Oh, so cool. it's like it's for love, yeah. And uh, it's like what type of you know lover are you? Uh, what compatibility? Like just deeper understanding of yeah. who you are in love. And we use that personality test in our content. So it's like when you we have contestants, we have them take the test. Yeah. And so there's just this natural curiosity from the audience. Like, yeah. I wonder what that is for me. And so it's just like organically has pushed a ton of um, users, you know, ma you know, massive email list now. And yeah. that's been the seed for the app that has just launched, which is Nectar. Oh, fascinating. Um, and so st slowly but surely, you know, we'll be building on yeah. top of that with the end goal being you know, how do we conquer the love space and, and do yeah. it and do it right? There there's a bunch of these assessments, quiz companies that yeah. do, you know, multi eight figures a year. Oh and my it's gosh. Just like, there's just like a f complete so, funnel, so which that's I'm sure where you're it seeing. started from, if I'm being honest. Like yeah. I, I had a dream. Um <laughs> it, yeah, this started from a dream I had, which was it was because I read an article on uh uh what is that skills this there's like a uh man Gallup runs Gallup, Gallup Strengths Finder. Strengths Finder. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. It's like um, I think I read that they have done collectively a billion in revenue mm -hmm. and like unbelievable margins. Yep. Like they're just printing money with this yep. thing. Yep. And uh, yeah, just my business mind was like, that is really attractive. That is really yep. cool. And so the very first thing we did, you know, I, I partnered with this um, company called Ground News. They, they create, they have this uh, sort of news bias tool. We're like, what if we, what if we partner with them to get a custom uh, quiz assessment into our middle ground show, so we what we this is almost like a test for like, can we push a lot of people to do something here? So in middle ground, which is all about like, you know, political viewpoints and and bridging divides, we had all of our cast take this news bias test. It was like, where do you consume your news from? How biased generally are these are these um, providers of you know news? And we would display their score on the show to our audience. And the audience was like, oh, this was super helpful. Like it, it gave us more context on the cast you invited, but then they all got really interested like what their news bias score would be. Mm. And we like, it was, um, I think it got two, the video got 2 million views. We had uh, tw like a 12% of our audience converted into taking this, this test, which is astronomical from a, con like typically conversions on YouTube are, you know, one, 2%. Mm -hmm. Um, so this, this to me became this like light bulb moment. Oh, we should, th there's something here. This might be the foray into love is digital, <clears throat> uh, interaction that we can bake into our content that pushes people to learn something more deeply about themselves. What that was the conversion rate to, on for, these? For what? On these quizzes, you said typical conversion rates one to two yeah. percent. What's this yeah. one? Oh, so that one was uh, the, the 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 first trial we did mm -hmm. was twelve percent. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So twelve percent of the audience that watched you know this million uh, million and a half two million view video mm -hmm. went on to take this assessment, and then it also became like a uh, like they would post their results on Twitter. Like it yeah. just became this moment. Yeah. And that that was like a light bulb for me, where like I I had a dream, and like I woke up at like five a.m. I just distinctly remember. I think I even like have a screenshot still. I, like sent an email yeah. or a Slack message to the leadership team. I was like, I think this is our move. Yeah. Um, this could be how we enter in the love space. 
Um, so that's that's the direction we're headed. But the long term vision is is like you know experiences and uh, you know truly competing at a, at a at a global scale with bringing love to the next generation of, of I people. love that and Jubilee is a good name for that it is true yeah yeah it's true cool so that's the future of it and so um you know one thing my uh chief of staff brought up um before this interview she she's like oh Jubilee that's so hype and then like so she's she's um so it says here Cody Co has 2.2 million subscribers on his backup channel and largely just reacts to Jubilee videos yeah. and so it sounds like um there's a lot of people copying your formats and everything yeah. like what's your your take on all that well, it depends who you ask. Um, I think everyone at Jubilee has a different feel about it. In general, there's no harm. There's no like, not harm. There's no hard feelings, I should say. Especially, um, like Cody Co is a, is a, is a friend. Um, and I think reaction content, we've actually, I think we've been thrilled by Ju- Jubilee entering Zeitgeist by like, you know, hundreds of millions of views from big like PewDiePie mm-hmm. had a whole series called Jubilee Reacts. And you know, often sometimes his videos reacting to our videos would get more views than our yeah. actual videos. Yeah. And sometimes it'd be like, well damn, like, you know, why can't why, you know, I wish our videos got that those viewership. But honestly, like just being part of the conversation is really cool. It's really cool to see people at that caliber, like, you know, of the of these creators feel like what Jubilee is doing is so unique that it needs to be reacted to. And for them to, anything they could be reacted to, anything they could be making content on, choose Jubilee. It's actually, I mean, I like that. I like that a lot. Where I think it gets a little, you know, confusing is the straight ripping of the content. So, you know, um, uh, Beta Squad and um, uh, Sidemen in the UK who are like, these, you know, massive influencer group will quite, I mean, quite literally, it's like the exact same thumbnail, mm-hmm. exact titling structure, uh, you know, take the format and just make it exactly their own. So yeah. it's like Logan Paul is doing the swipe date Tinder in real life and the whole, the exact same like thumbnail design, everything. So at that point, the reason I actually don't mind it in general, but the reason it, the reason it, it, it does bother me is um, people, st- there just starts becoming this confusion mm. of like, wait, like, who is making what? Um, people think they're watching a Jubilee video or they think they're watching, you know, a Sidemen video or whatever it is. There's this confusion. And then as someone date, like kind of very data oriented, something I used to track regularly was what percentage of the videos being shown on our videos on the side are our videos. So suggested videos, yep. what percentage of the suggested videos are ours? Over time, as more and more people started ripping the content, that percentage would decrease because mm. it'd be like, well, if you like this one, you'll like this other, this one. other one. That's the same it's thing. very same thing, yeah. <laughs> and so it would just start creating this cannibalization effect of right. our of our suggested thing. And then there's this one guy who's like, uh, I think it was his name, David Alvarezzi. His channel is is just like com- is completely jubilee, uh, like every show, like you know, Spectrum, uh, you know, uh, Odd One Out, Ranking versus. I was just like he's taking like every show unashamedly. Right. Um, that that one I'm not the biggest fan of, but I, otherwise I think it's a it's a nod to jubilee. I I think I would just wish that they would package it in their own way. Like there's no there's no truly original idea, right? In fact, you could look at some of our shows and be like. This was inspired by the board game I played yeah. as a kid. You know what I mean? So we're all just building on, we're top, all building of on top of yeah. each other. Yeah. But like, let's just present it a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, you, so. you mentioned Logan Paul. So what's like the, the story about a, the coolest collab you've done? Coolest collab? Um, I, think, I think it was one of our earliest ones, which was fun, was we did Odd One Out. Um, so we have a show where it's like one person's lying and the other... and, and Everyone else is trying to figure out who's lying. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we did a virtual odd one out with PewDiePie where his fans were trying to figure out who is PewDiePie. Like everyone had their cameras off. It's virtual because it's the only way you could do this concept. And um, he, he was eliminated in the first, in, like they, they, they like sniffed him out like right, right away. It was mm-hmm. super hilarious, very fun, <laughs> fun to do. So we did that multiple times. Like we did that with Cody Co. Cody Co is now starting to get into Jubilee content more and more. Mm. Um, it's fun. 
uh, but then we also we've also done uh, like we did a Spectrum episode with the Queer Eye cast as well for you know the Netflix show. Um, that was very fun as well. Um, but I would say I would say like our you know working with our favorite YouTubers like Cody Ko, Graham Stephan, yeah. being in our in our content regularly is always is is always fun. Um, but the PewDiePie one stands out to me a lot. And then there's this one kid who well, maybe was our earliest collab, but it wasn't like a giant one. I just I just love I think he's like I've told him this to his face probably about eight years ago. I think he's one of my favorite creators, super talented. His name is Matoki. Matoki Max Ted. Um we had him in one of our very first pilots four versus one and he crushed it. And I think he his performance is actually a big reason why the show um took off a, a, as it did. I love when we bring in like up and coming talented people who maybe you maybe not everyone has heard of and it just puts them on a whole new you know a whole new platform so matoki uh is is super talented um so i'm uh, that was one i was just excited about because i i loved it so, so much. there's two questions here yeah. then say how do you spot the up-and-coming talent and then also well, we'll start with that first up-and-coming talent so there's two there's two things one is just like sheer like like personality like um you know you're not look, looking at necessarily their production ability you're just looking at who they are from a personality perspective they're they're witty they're they're like they they just entertain you effortlessly that to me is like a matoki where i just everything he does i'm just like this is awesome this is hilarious like where did you where like you're confused by where they even got that idea from or how you know that's that's to me very powerful talent, and those are the people that I think um, have the, you know, potentially the the, the longest l life in front of them because it can apply to so many different mediums. Like he was, he just was on uh, Young Sheldon like um, the the other the other day. I think he's now kicking off his like Hollywood career because he's so versatile. He's just as a personality amazing. Started digital, but he can go anywhere with it. I think he's very very talented. Then you have I think creators or you know talent or hosts who I don't actually think personality matters as much as like passion and grit matters. Mm. Um, because so there's, there's a, there's a, a, a fitness uh, health wellness creator who I I've known for many years. His name is uh, Shervin. He's got a channel called Shervin shares. And I, kn I, I knew that and I still believe this, even though he's not like massive today. I think he's got like a hundred thousand subscribers. When he was just at like five k subscribers, this guy's going to be big. And the reason is because he was like, "I want this more than anything. I'm like revolving my entire life around this. I'm going to move into like an apartment with like three other creators, and we're going to push each other to be better. And like, like this would be like all he talks about." He's just obsessed with it. He's like, how am I going to figure this out? How am I going to crack it? Always meeting with every creator he could possibly meet with to pick their brain. That to me is way more indicative of yep. whether you're going to be successful as a creator, way more in indicative than like your raw uh, creative or personality talent. Yeah. Like even Mr. Beast, if you look at his original, like they're, they're pretty bad. Yeah. Like he, and he wasn't really a good personality at all. Yeah. But the obsession... Like is what is what carries you yeah. carries you through. So are, so are you saying so? What one half is like? Um, you know, you've got the it factor. You've got a lot of charisma. The yes. other one is just like you're just grinding it through, like a Mr. Beast. And I think that that's the. I think that's the most important one. Yeah. The other one is just like finding a diamond in the rough. Like mm -hmm. they're they're just wired that way. They're creative. Like yeah, you could develop that a little bit, but it's it's the creators who, like I think every aspect of you being a good creator, mostly can be learned. And so it's truly the people that are the most hungry. Like, I'm not stopping till I figure this out. I love this so much. I want this to be my life. Those are the people that, you know, I, I bet are going to win. And um, time and time again, the ones that I, like, have identified that fit that camp, I've yet to, I've yet to, there's yet to be anyone who um, has that level of passion and grit and isn't winning. And it's the same thing with like startups, right? Like, it, kind of the same model of like, well, you don't you, you don't fail until you give up. Yeah. So it's the same thing with creators. Like, yep. if, if you just keep going, you're it's like you're gonna win. It's just a matter yeah. of how long can you stick it out. Yeah. Um. 
So yeah, there's another guy, another kid who's also in the health and wellness space, ironically, but um, his name is, uh, what is his name? Eric. Eric uh, and he, he has a channel called Reisu. And um, he is someone who's similarly like, man, I, I am just, this is all I want in my life. I'm just going to keep grinding. I'm going to keep doing this. And he has, I think, 50,000 subscribers today. But like, I, I, I know he's going to have a million subscribers one day because mm-hmm. he's he's just that focused and that yeah. passionate about it. So are you trying to buy in, like, like buy a piece of their... I offered that to Shervin yeah. um, when he was small. Um, it, it Nothing came came of it. Uh, and, what was the offer? Well, we didn't even get to numbers. So yeah. I was just like, man, I, I think you're going to be... I think you're going to be big. He's like, I, he actually, I don't know if he wants to be saying this, but he applied to, uh, cause Mr. Beast has had something like that too, called creative juice. He's like, I actually applied to that and they like re- rejected me. Um, I was like, Oh dude, they, it, they, if they're looking at it from a paper on paper, mm-hmm. maybe I can see that, but I will never bet. I will never invest in a creator unless I like know you yeah. really well. So like, I don't think that their model of vetting people like, I guess you could be like, oh, what's their trajectory? And they seem like they're on a good path. But for me, Shervin and like every other creator I know, it's more about how bad do they want it. Yeah. And if I see there's just like uh, unending, um, you know, desire to to crush it here, like I I I will bet on them any day. So there's this guy, uh, Dave Perel. He mm-hmm. invested in uh, the cultural tutor, right? Uh, this this guy on, on Twitter who has like millions of followers now, I believe. This guy was working at McDonald's and he's like, hey, like, what is it going to take for you to just quit your McDonald's job? I read about this. Yeah. yeah. And so like, I'm just wondering like, how do you structure that? Are you giving them 25, 50 grand and yeah. taking, like a YC, we're looking at a YC poster right now. Yeah. Are you putting in 20 to 70 grand or something and taking 7%? Like, yeah. how would you structure it? If yeah, you're if I were structuring it? something like that, I think it would be, um, and it would be up to the creators like uh, des- desire to to do this, but you know it would be giving the upfront capital necessary for them to you know it's like what are your bottlenecks like what what wh- where can this resource go to sort of uh, increase the the speed of your trajectory like growth um, how much do you need for that to be impactful so for someone like you know. Uh, a Shervin, you know, I would have, it's like, okay, can you, and this was, I think he still had a, like a job at this time. It's like, okay, if you, if, if you had 50 K, could you quit your job? And could you just focus on this full time as opposed to just, you know, one day a week where you have enough time from work? Like, I think you would four or five X your growth if you could just solely focus on this. Um, and so he, you know, he chose to just grind, grind it out and he did end up quitting his job without, I don't think, you know, any sort of investment, but 50 K, whatever the amount is for you to just be able to focus all of your attention to, to this thing. Um, and feel like you don't need to be constantly searching for money. So if you're like, last thing I would want is someone to be selling out their channel to like brand partners, like early on yeah. just to make ends meet. And then it would be a percentage in perpetuity. It mm-hmm. would be like, um, yeah, like 50 K for 20 per, I, this, you know, might feel, feel aggressive to to a creator, but it just depends on how much value that 50k would be to them up front. Yep. But 50k for 10, 20 percent in perpetuity. Yeah. Um, and you know, it is not un you know, it's not unlike startup investing. It's also not unlike. Um, have you heard of a company called Jelly Smack? Yeah. Yeah. So it's also not like those types of models where it's like, hey. Um, I am going to help you unlock like new opportunity, new revenue, and as a result, you know we're we're going to split in that in that newfound revenue. And in this case, it's like we're unlocking more invest like your time to invest in this channel and the upside as a result. And so I'm going to participate on that. And also, I can help you. Like you know, I can help you on brand partnership side. I can help you content strategy. Um, if I'm putting you know my money mm-hmm. in. Uh, I, I want to see you succeed. Yep. Um, Have you done a few of these yet? No, okay. none. Um, it, it is something I'm very interested in. And, uh, it's, I, I think I'm a little, yeah, sometimes I feel concerned that it could be predatory because there is, yeah, you know, like you, even you just said it, right? Like, oh, that's a good, that's a good deal. Um, yeah. I mean, perpetuity is kind of tough. It's tough. <laughs> yeah. It's tough. Even I think Creative Juice doesn't even do perpetuity. I think they just do like, 
uh, like five, three or five years or something like yeah. that. But oh, to, that's generous. To, yeah, to yeah. me, I'm like, I, I don't know if that's worth it either. Um, that's too low. I think perpetuity yeah. is too long. Yeah. So it's like an in between. Right. Um, but no, I have, I have not done anything like that yet. It, Interesting. I, I, I know I will. It's just a matter of when. For Got sure. it. So it's, look, it sounds like, I mean, with Jubilee, you know, things are going well, right? And then you just mentioned that you took a break for a year. So yeah. why did you decide to take a step back from Jubilee? Yeah. Well, um, building the business for like six years straight was definitely a, a grind. Um, you know, I, I was working a lot. I have, I had a daughter and I, I don't, fe I didn't feel like I was really mentally as present as I wanted to be as, as a dad. Like even when I was like playing with her, I'd just be like thinking about, you know, work or a meeting or strategy or whatever it is. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I was approaching sort of burnout. Right. And so mm. I took sabbatical or, you know, mid or early mid last year just to recharge and spend time with family, but also to do things that I was not able to do over the past like six years, which was just like, because I was so heads down building, I, I didn't even get to like, I couldn't do this. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't meet other entrepreneurs, hang out with friends in the, in the space. I just started hanging out and, you know, seeing what people were up to and enjoying like, like this whole smell of the flowers kind of thing. Like I was enjoying sort of life a bit. Uh, as a result of doing that, I just would have really fascinating, really interesting conversations with other entrepreneurs, other business owners. And that, you know, really, I think, put me on a different a different path, which is the path I'm on now. Got it. This message is brought to you by Leveling Up Founders. And Leveling Up Founders is an invite-only event for founders. It happens once a year, usually during August. And past attendees include people such as Ali Abdal, Cody Sanchez, Neil Patel, Vanessa Lau, and the list goes on and on. And ultimately, it comes down to the quality of the group of the people. We tried to keep the group high caliber. That's why it's invite only. So if you are a founder at the top of your game, you can go to levelingup.com slash founders to learn more about it and you can apply and we'll see you on the other side. How many, when you said you're approaching burnout, how, how long, how many hours do you think you're working per week? I was, so the working, working like at a laptop, uh, probably 50, 60 hours. Mm -hmm. But then there's the like mental working, which yeah. is just like, I don't, I don't think I mean, maybe like for the for the sit down sitting down at dinner with like my my family and like talking. Outside of that, I think I was always always working like in my head. Yeah, like you're thinking, thinking about, about it. like yeah. so a lot. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I like I just was I was mentally always thinking about work. Yeah, um, and that became just not. Yeah, that's just not. Yeah, I don't know. Just not the life I, I think I wanted to live. And it's not. It wasn't a function of you know, Jubilee or anything is just like, okay, this is, you know, there's like 50 people now and like, I've got all day meetings tomorrow. So when do I actually work uh, yeah. now? You know, yeah. so um, it just became, it became a lot. And now I'm trying to build intentionally a life where that's not what happens. Got it. Yeah. So, and then did you hire, did you guys hire like your replacement? Like what happened? Yeah, so we, so before I, before I went on, uh, leave is really, I think the only reason, only reason uh, I felt comfortable going on leave is because we brought on a head of operations mm. and she was working very closely with me. I like, I brain dumped basically everything. I was like, okay, let's open the books. Like let's do projections together. Let's talk about you know, everything. Brought her into the fold, very, very involved. <laughs> and uh, she, she was super sharp. Uh, we brought on a like head of people, like a people culture yeah, person yeah. as well. Those two people felt like I felt like they were um, in my absence, totally able to push push the ball the ball forward. And I was honestly, if, I, if I'm being completely honest with myself, I was getting so close. I mean, I, I, I think I I definitely hit the burnout phase. I like hit hit a wall. I don't even think at that moment in time that I was able to even operate at my best anyway. So they had this sort of fresh perspective, the fresh energy to be able to, I think, blow past me. Um, the first few, four, three, four, five years of Jubilee, like I was a machine. Yeah. Uh, but then I was like, it's time for some new yeah. blood, new new energy. You think it's also like, because, um, you know, I, I I look at all my friends that, founder friends that end up having kids and then everything just changes afterwards. Your perspective is like, work is no longer number one. It's 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 true. 
and I think I think it took me a little bit longer to get that perspective shift. Like it wasn't until oh, so I mean, this exactly happened. Was um, and this actually, yeah, I should have mentioned this. The catalyst was sitting. It was in, over on Christmas. My daughter was like wanted to play with my my wife, and you know, she's like, oh, mommy, can you play, etc. And my wife was like, oh, why don't you, you know, why don't you go play with you know, daddy. And she's like, Oh, daddy, daddy just likes to work. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't like to play. And I was like, Oh, that, that's, is that, is that how she thinks of me? Yeah. Uh, it was like, after that, like I was kind of wrecked for like a, a week. I was like, man, um, okay, I need to fix that. Uh, and so I, yeah, it, 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 I think maybe I was blind to that up until that point. And, and her, hearing her say that was, uh, like a sort of, you know, uh, knife to the chest, and that was like, mm, this is not good. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, the, having the kid for some people it can be immediate, where it's like, this is this is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Others, if you have a soul or a heart, you start, you know, you start seeing how your influence, your time, your impact, like the impact it has on the kid, and you either want to change it or you or you don't. But yeah. for me, I, I did. I did want to change. Um, well, that's that's good. So, how does how does your life look now? It's very different. I mean, I still work, I still work a good amount, but very cognizant of, uh, of of building a life that is not overwhelmed or you know, work is not everything. So I'm intentionally like I'm working right now. I just launched an agency, and the idea is to build it, actually to build it to function without me. So my goal is about nine months, like three, you know, three quarters from now, by end of this year, I'm not even involved in the day to day. Interesting. So um, it, I, I brought on a partner who I think is, is, is going to help tremendously there. His whole motto is like he, he, he built uh, previous agencies as well. And he built them all to operate largely without him. And so I'm, 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 I'm learning from him on how to do that because it's, such a priority. If that weren't such a priority, I don't even think I would have brought him on as a partner. Right. Um, I would just build the agency on my own. But I truly want to value time with family, freedom, flexibility. And so that's that's how I'm building Got this it. agency. You guys are 50-50? No. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's my my business. Um, but he's kind of strategic, you know, advisor. He is going to be spending a lot of time on the on the work, helping hire, train, etc. Mm. Because he's built functional scaled agencies before yep. it's really just guiding how how to scale out the agency yeah but so he's temporary no no for, forever partner okay got it yeah. got it, got it. Okay. so uh you know profit sharing yeah. like you know percent of distributions uh if it's sold percentage yeah. of that uh so but phantom yeah, equity yeah got yeah. it got yeah. it yeah. um and so how I guess why uh, why do an agency? Um, because there's so you know obviously I have an agency. There's a negative stigma towards agencies and all that. I'm just curious your your decision on it. Great question. Um, so actually, when, when I was on sabbatical, I, I I developed a framework of like actually I borrowed it from from my buddy where it's like uh, an Excel spreadsheet on the left where it's like what do you want out of life? Like all the things that are important to you, and then. Uh, on the columns, like the different opportunities in front of you, the thing that scored the lowest was an agency. Mm-hmm. It was like antithetical to everything I wanted yeah. in life. Yeah. The thing that scored the highest was like, um, you know, uh, a sort of course paid community model. Um, and so the reason, the reason I started an agency is because, if I'm being completely honest, I, uh, was getting approached like I, I was making content on Twitter and you know a little bit on LinkedIn a while ago, and people people were just like reaching out to me and they're like, hey, I have this business, like we have this need, we don't know how to do X Y Z thing. Can you help us? And I actually like in my heart like wanted to help them. Like I was like, that's a really interesting problem. Like I w- I actually would like to crack that for you. Um, and so the the unique problems that were coming my way were like I like I like I wanted to solve them. Um and so one by one I would like help solve these problems and they it would like work. It work, you know, we would have a massive success doing it. And so it almost organically spun up into, well, 
I guess if you just keep doing this, that's that's what an agency is. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, and and so I do I do actually really like helping people. Uh, the the thing the thing that is antithetical to my life values is I think running and operating an agency at scale. And so if we, if we were to have this conversation tw- like you know twelve months from now, the accountability factor would be like, are you still running? on a day-to-day basis, this agency, my answer should be no. Mm-hmm. If it's not, then I've done something wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, the partner I brought on, the whole reason I, you know, big reason I brought him on, and well, and he's like super smart, but um, that's how he's built all his agencies was like one call a week, hire strong operators, give them the framework, like help in, like help in the beginning, get the foundation right, and then step back. Um, so that's, that's, that's going to be, I think, my approach to this. Interesting. Yeah. So, and I, I saw on your your website. So, the, one of the the taglines here is scaling ten million dollar plus companies with YouTube. So, what does that mean? So, I think not. You know, to me, everybody everybody who owns a business, um, maybe not everybody, but most everybody who owns a business should be thinking about how they can scale their their revenue, their sales, underlying business with content. I I, I truly, truly, truly believe that like. Today, having a great product, having great customer service, like like that's a, that's not a competitive advantage anymore. I feel like that's just like a requirement. You have to have those things. the The competitive advantage from here on out, I I, I feel like, is audience. It's distribution, and um, my goal and and I can help businesses at any stage. But I found the sweet spot is for companies that are doing around ten million and above who have the ability to invest like properly in you don't even need that big of a team but invest in the resources to make the content i can take the, like if if you're committed to youtube for one two three years like i have a framework that i feel quite confident that youtube can be a massive lever to to uh, scale your your revenue your business two three years down the line so that your uh competitive advantage is on top of the good product and service you have is as actual community is is audience is distribution got it um so that's that's my whole focus today is helping businesses in almost every industry yeah. with decent enough traction to invest in the next five years of their of their business growth got it. and what would be like an example of like a eight-figure company you've helped um, with audience building, like what yeah. was it before and after? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the biggest one is, I guess the biggest one would be Netflix. So we've, we we worked with Netflix when they were trying to build out their um, early day original YouTube strategy. So how can we drive more tune in? Like tune in to is what what they refer to as like you know we we just launched a show. We want people to actually watch it. What kind of YouTube content can we make so that it actually drives um, people to watch the shows more. So they have a, a channel they wanted to spin up called Still Watching Netflix. It's like a separate channel. Um, and the idea was to help them develop original formats that bring in elements of the show, or whether it's cast, whether it's like themes of the show. Uh, but they're entertaining to watch on their own. Like these formats are entertaining to watch on their own. And, uh, and create like intrigue interest for people to want to then go watch the, the full show on Netflix. So we developed uh, a, a few formats for them and gave them the framework for like how to develop uh, formats on their own, train, you know, train their team. And that, that channel now is, uh, is one of their biggest. So I think it's uh, about six or 7 million subscribers. We started working with them when they had, I don't know, for 400 like K subscribers and it was mostly not great content. Um, so giving them the tools, the framework to actually think about what is original content on YouTube that gets people interested in watching our shows more. Got That's it. one example. The other, I would say is sm- like on the smaller end, although I, he, he for sure will be in an eight figure business is, um, uh, Pat walls of, of starter, starter story. story yeah. yeah. Starter story is, I don't know how you would describe. I guess it's like consumer SaaS or something like subscription model, uh, helping people who want to be entrepreneurs understand uh, the landscape of 
different types of companies, how other people started their company. And his, his, his whole idea was like, okay, I think beyond SEO, beyond all these things I'm doing, content is, is the move. And so I helped him from video number one, figuring out how to make content that is actually watched and seen on YouTube. And, uh, you know, like 10 videos later, 15 videos later, he's at 100K subscribers. A handful more videos later, he's at 200K subscribers. But the more important thing is his underlying business has like doubled as a result you know, he already had a seven-figure business. His underlying business doubled as a result of YouTube. Yeah, and he's like quadrupling down on on on, on YouTube, and yeah. you know, all measures showing the top line like revenue growth. The leading driver is his YouTube channel. Well, what is his business anyway? Because I know he makes those videos and he talks about it on Twitter. Mm -hmm. What does he sell? So it's a it's a subscription business. Like our, you know, like you you pay for membership to Starter Store for content. For content, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, it's it's content, but it's also like it's like a database almost, where it's like, look, if you are interested in starting a business, it's this whole database of like, let's say you're interested in starting an agency, or yeah. you're interested in starting a lawn mowing business, or you name it. You just search that in Starter Story, and Pat and his team have interviewed thousands of operators on their come up story, like how you know how they vetted the business the business idea, what they did to get from zero to one traction, how they scaled it. So it gives you, um, you know, real world insights into how people across any business built their business from zero to one. And so a lot of, I would say a lot of like entrepreneurs or a lot of people who are just like about to enter or beginner entrepreneurs use Starter Story as a fuel to their, to their, to their fire. Mm -hmm. And so the content on YouTube is like very synergistic with that because we're yeah. bringing some of these stories to life yeah. and getting people to be like, oh, I, like there's thousands of these on Starter Story. Oh, great. Let me go. Let yeah. me go check those out. Got it. By the way, Neil and I have an agency owners group called the Agency Owners Association. All you have to do, just go to marketingschool.io slash agency. Once again, it's marketingschool.io slash agency to learn more. And now back to the show. What would you say, because you've coached a lot of people with YouTube, so what would you yeah. say are some common YouTuber mistakes? Yeah, the most obvious one of just becoming more obvious to people is that I, I like your idea doesn't really matter. Like you, the idea you have for how epic the video is going to be, I should say, like what you think is going to happen in the video, like that doesn't really matter. The thing that matters the most is the idea that's presented to the audience. So thumbnail and title is extremely important. That's even at Jubilee when we first started, we 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 had the opposite approach. We would be like, "What are cool like ideas, and how do we make it come to life in a cool way?" Now everything is from packaging first perspective. You 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 have to actually think about like you have an idea, immediately move to is this even worth making? Like, is this thumbnail and title something people have to click into? If not, it doesn't really matter like how you think, how epic what's going to happen in the video is. It's a decent chance it'll be a waste of time. It, it's not always the case, but the odds are that it will be a waste of time if you can't figure out a compelling packaging for it because then no one's going to click it. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's by far the biggest mistake is not approaching content development from a, a packaging first, thumbnail title mm -hmm. first Approach. And when you say packaging, yeah. that also means like, you know, the cuts and like, you know, the the 30 second intro. Not, like, what are not, you talking no, about? No, not yeah. really. So packaging literally meaning um, thumbnail title only. Okay, got it. Yeah. Got so it. so the, the two things that really matter uh, is CTR, like what percentage of people who get served your video yeah. click into it. And then once they're into it, how long do they watch? Right. That's like... I have I have that like formula. It's not even. Yeah. It's just like uh, you know CTR times retention, you know, inked into my brain because it's it's truly when you think about how to help people with YouTube, it's that's kind of really it. Yeah, it's it's like a, as simple as that. In fact, yeah. I think half of my maybe more half of the coaching that I that I do is just getting people to to tune out the noise in their head of like, oh, I got to get this right. I got to get this right. Or, yeah. 
it like those all those things you're thinking about don't matter. It's really just whatever moves CTR and whatever moves retention. Got it. Um, So those are the two biggest things for sure. What kind of C, and this is a very general question, but what kind of CTR are you looking for in general and what kind of retention Uh percentage are you looking for? Um, Or is it more AVD? No, no. uh, It's, so so CTR for me, anything above 10%. So I'm I'm always targeting a 10% CTR, but caveat is depends on how big your channel is. So if you're, if you have a decent sized channel, um, you know, where the viewership is in the tens of thousands at a minimum, then I actually, I look at day one CTR because the, 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 the total CTR average does not really matter. The reason being, if you have a viral video, oftentimes your CTR can drop because YouTube's trying to push it to literally everyone in the world. And so, you know, uh, you know, a mom in Missouri might not really be that interested in your video. It's it's really when the when your video first goes out to your subscribers, that's the constant. What how how interesting is it even to them? And so, at, on the first first day CTR, I'm aiming for at least ten percent. Somewhere between seven and ten is like good. Ten percent and above. If you have high uh, view duration and ten percent above CTR. I would bet nine times out of ten that that video is going to do extremely well. Mm. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, in views, and in mm. average view duration, I think it's mostly uh, more watch time than it is percentage. Mm. Um, but f- five plus, you know, five plus minutes is is the bare minimum like mm. that you want to be aiming for. Yeah, and like te- you know, eight ten minutes plus is like great. Yeah. yeah, that's why podcasts do so well. Podcasts like, are awesome. Yeah, podcasts are awesome. And and do you do you publish this on uh, like audio only as well? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Because yeah. so we launched a podcast at Jubilee, and I was stunned by the we 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 had like percentage completion of Retention's like ninety way higher. On like podcasts. it's like yeah yeah like om, almost like in the ninety percent. Yeah. Like I was like, geez, that's that's incredible. Yeah, it's way better uh, than YouTube. It's way better, yeah. way better. Yeah. yeah. Um. And so on the business side, the, the the thing that matters to me the most also is how much time your audience is spending with you, which is why I love YouTube so much. When you think about the impact on business, it's truly a function of like the amount of time and the amount of risk that your audience takes on you times the value that you provide them. Right. And no other platform, in my opinion, optimizes for that better than than YouTube. Got it. Yeah. I want to come back to the, the so going back to the the packaging piece. Yeah. How obviously we know Mr. Beast might spend hundreds of thousands on a thumbnail and like so how much time and how much money do you think you're spending on packaging per video? I it's a, it's really important. Um I, and just to set the stage here like I don't think we do this enough and mm-hmm. you can see like we're more like these types of interviews like we're lucky if we get 6 or 7%, right? right. It's usually like anywhere from like three to 5% right. or so. Right. Um, and I just don't think we're spending enough time. Mm-hmm. So go for it. Yeah. So here, here, here's what I would, there's a couple things that come to my mind with based on what you just said, which is like, for you, um, this might sound ruthless, but like I, you know, you want to be, is good. yeah, you want, you, you want to be thinking about who you're even, like who you're even inviting and what the angle is for the guest before you even invite them. Mm-hmm. So it's like you, you almost should have a reason for a, like a strong thumbnail and title for the guest before you even commit to inviting them here. Mm-hmm. Because what might happen is like you invite the guest, you think the person has an interesting story and then you, and then you make the podcast and then you're like, okay, well, so what's, you know, what's the, what should we title this? Yeah. Right. Or, yeah. Uh, I I really do believe that that's the reverse order. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we spend a lot of time. And, and in fact, we typically make about three, you know, two or three thumbnails minimum. Mm-hmm. There's a whole niche, a whole like community on Twitter of unbelievably talented thumbnail designers. And I would say today that that is the vast majority of where all my thumbnails get designed. Mm. So, um I mean, I, I have a whole list that yeah. I, I can you send share some you. thumbnail yeah, could, dealers. I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. can send you. That wasn't I, very ruthless at all. <laughs> no, no. So, I, so the the ruthless piece is like, like maybe you shouldn't even invited me. You know, it's mm-hmm. like like who who you're inviting should be based on how good 
Or, you know, may, and maybe you do have a, a good hand. Oh, I have an angle here. He got 14 million subs and 5 billion views from YouTube. His secret playbook. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, great, there you great. go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, did, so when did you when did you come up with that? Uh, this week. Okay. Yeah. So ahead of time. Yeah. Okay. But, but I that usually was don't. after you invited me. Right? Uh, yes. It was, well, I was trying to figure out the angle. Okay. Yeah. Great, yeah. Great. Yeah. So if you, if you're doing that consistently, I think that that's cool. Um, I'm inconsistent with it. Okay. Yeah. But, but, but so I guess what you I'm know saying why? is because yeah. I expect my team to figure it out. Right? <laughs> got it. So, got it. So got I, it. I, I have a bad habit of like, if I can figure it out, you guys should be able to sure, figure it out. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, I think I just, what I'm getting at is I've seen too many podcasts and, and even some of them are with clients where it's like, Oh yeah, let me invite this. Like this person's done a lot of cool things, and then they make the thing, and it's just it's not like they don't have a good. There's they don't have enough of an angle to get a mass market interested in that conversation. Mm. So it's like you you should know ahead of time. And actually, Sean Sean Peary just put out a, a great tweet on this for his. He was prepping for a Gary V podcast. Yeah, it's like what is the what is the uh, the juicy question you're going to ask to get like sound bites out but of it. Let's work on this one because yeah. Gary Vee is going to be sitting in that seat in two weeks. Oh yeah? Cool. So here, let's cool. work. So I have an angle. Yeah, tell me. Bro, why do your YouTube video views drop so much? <laughs> and what happened to your NFT project? Yeah. Right? Yes. So like, but I'm actually scared to ask this. No, you should ask him that. You should have asked that. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think the more you get, the more you get, uh, I'm all about juicy and the more you have sound bites that can be clipped into shorts, the better I think it makes the whole video itself. Um, but then also asking questions that like people are secretly dying to know, but like are afraid to ask is like the, the exact type of questions you want to ask. I got another one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> so I, I, I think most people, because I've seen also too many podcasts where it just feels like a pleasant conversation and it doesn't really, you know, it's just too fluffy. Yeah. It's just like, I didn't really learn. Any, I mean, I learned something. Yeah. But I didn't really learn, like hit, you know, get the hard hitting questions, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I, I would definitely go like Gary V has said everything under the sun. So like, what's going to make your podcast with him different? Like yeah. hit him with things he wasn't expecting or, you know, like um, get, take the, the Nardwar approach. Do you know who Nardwar is? No. So it's, uh, he's this Canadian, um, you know, sort of goofy character who interviews rappers and he blows their like he finds he asks them questions where they're like wondering if he like works for the FBI yeah because he's like asking him about a kid who grew up on his block when they're like six and he's like how did you know that yeah. like were you talking to my mom like like all like their like minds are blown in that conversation right. and and someone who's inspired by Nardwar was also Sean Evans like from Hot Ones um, it's like finding the questions that like more most people are not asking those um, right. So and by the way, so if it's you're doing you're doing a video, like you're gonna come up with the, yeah. the concept. So, right? so you're not I'll, gonna delegate I'll, that. I'll review. I'll review. Um, especially for clients, mm -hmm. they'll send me their question list ahead of time. Yeah. So like, I these are just these are either platitudes or these are just soft questions. Like everyone's asked them. Don't don't ask these questions. Like yeah. so we'll we'll so we'll we'll rework an entire question list, uh, just based on, um, you know what what we think would actually hit harder. The other, I can't call this a secret, but it's, it's no one's really using this. I think Gary would be, if, if you have enough pull on Gary, um, a, a massive move for podcasts is if you're, in, if you're inviting people who are on, uh, on your podcast who have pre-existing YouTube audience, ask them to share, once it goes live, ask them to share the video on their community tab on, mm. on YouTube. It's a very light ask, but it's like a retweet times 10,000 because it goes out to their subscribers on their new on their home feed as if that creator just published a video. Mm. Like it looks like it's like, you know, Gary V just published this video, but it's like your video. Yeah. Uh, and it it can be very massive for 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 traction for distribution. That's a good one. Um and I don't know anybody that's like doing this or prioritizing this. And it's so, it's so easy to do. So anytime you have someone like I've seen you got like Cody Sanchez, like Alex Ramosi, like yeah. I've had guests who've had them on too. And I'm like, dude, just get them to share it. And then they share it and it like, you know, pops off. Right. Um, so give your, give your channel like a little, little bit of a, of a boost with yeah. um, a very low lift, like ask on their part. Yeah. Um, that's another, another thing I do.
Got it. This message is brought to you by Single Grain. Single Grain is a marketing agency ran by yours truly. Single Grain does paid media, SEO, creative, conversion rate optimization, and has worked with a handful of companies such as Uber, Amazon, Airbnb, Salesforce, to startups, venture back startups, a lot of different companies. And ultimately, our mission is to do innovative marketing that drives customers. If you want to learn more, just go to singlegrain.com. Again, it's single grain, grain like wheat. And we'll see you on the other side. Just a couple more things from my side. So what do you think is what, what, like, obviously there's like a meta, right? Like podcasts are like big, short forms like big, but like, what do you think is fading and what are you excited about? I I actually, I'm not the biggest, I think short form is a, is like, I think short form has its purpose. It's a little, it's like very top of funnel, like awareness, exposure. And there are, there are plenty of exceptions where it can, be amazing for conversion but by and large the amount of creators that i've coached that i've worked with the amount of businesses that i've worked with who have invested time and energy into short form and you know they've gotten an audience they get viewership and it's like what did it do for me is (laughs) a staggering um i i i so i guess what i'm saying is like I am hoping short form is a dying is a is sort of a dying trend as, as, at least as it relates to businesses co- you know folks who are trying to drive revenue with content um it will always have its its place in entertainment but I am most excited about I mean that's why I launched this agency I'm starting to see this like the fad was short form because like it's easy it's easy to do it's easy to get momentum you could have a million you know, followers in like four months. And I'm starting to see a bunch of people like scratch their heads and be like, wait, like, so why isn't this doing anything for us? And, and they're starting to realize like long form is far more impactful. Even though it's harder, it's far more impactful. So I'm actually very excited about this like shift to prioritizing good storytelling, good you know, ideation, good execution on long form um, as a way to drive you know, massive, massive business. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I actually asked someone yesterday that's paying $45,000 a month to an agency. Um, and Doing you know, what? Pumping out like 5,000 short form pieces Jeez. per month. And so 5,000 5, 5, short 000. form pieces Well, a month? it's really 1,000, uh-huh. you know, sent to five different platforms. Oh, so that's okay. 5,000. Jeez. But so I'm like, okay, well, you know, I talked to you a couple months ago and we, I, I asked you then what was the what was the ROI? She's yeah. like we don't know yet. Yeah. And then when I asked her yesterday, she was like, "Yeah, you know, we're just like you can't measure the ROI on this. Like, yeah, they're getting you know maybe a hundred million views per month or so, but like who cares?" And then you know we we've been experimenting on our own stuff. It's not like we're getting a ton of views, but last thirty days or so, ten million views, which is like decent for B two B. But it's it like okay, like what is it doing for us, yeah. right? And to your point, long form is the way to go because most people don't want to do long form. Most people don't want to do long form. Yeah. It's it's hard. It's hard to find good talent. It's it's more expensive, but when if, if you have a if you have a multi year view, like nothing will beat long form. Mm-hmm. Nothing. I I, like I I firmly firmly believe believe that. Yeah. Um. The only the only thing I can see, like short form again is just I think it's more of an awareness play, mm-hmm. just like planting the seed of your name, yeah. your brand, in people's head. But that seed needs to be watered and that what you know in bloom. And that only happens with long form, in my right. opinion. Again, there are exceptions like Scrub Daddy. There's a you know yeah. company called you know Mini Katana. Like uh, I wrote a write up on them, and like yeah. there, there are exceptions. It's just a rare exception. Yeah. I think the best people can do is like probably put a call to action, and then like Cody Sanchez has like the little um, Mini Chat bot where it's like, yeah. hey, you know, uh, she does that, yeah. comment money if you want this resource, and that works really well for them. Yeah, it's true. So. We were talking about creator operators yeah. um, before the show. So, what what's your take on on this 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 phrase or this phenomenon? Because like, there's creators only. Mm-hmm. Then there's people that actually operate businesses yeah. that are creators. It's true. Yeah. Um, creator operators. Well, I am starting to see a trend where creators are actually hiring um, like truer, you know, more more traditional business operators to build out their their empires. I actually think that's super smart, um, and I actually think more and more creators should actually be leveraging uh whether it's you know people to f- to fill the void of their you know skill set um and and bring on like you know talent so they can focus on what they do best um this idea of like creators building a business outside of just their content is also extremely exciting to me uh and i think that this that's a trend that's only going to accelerate as well 
um, it, what what aspect of the creator operator uh, business is like most interesting to you? I guess I so for for Neil and I, for example, yeah. we probably spend eighty to ninety percent of our time on the business, mm-hmm. ten to twenty percent on creating, right? And thus we have better business results. Mm-hmm. Um, I think most creators where they lose sight is like 80-90% is spent on creating, which is maybe okay but if they're the talent, yeah. but then they get screwed on the business side. And so I think we're seeing a, a greater, you know, more, pe- more and more people are warming up to, hey, like you need to be creating content. And so I think there's a rise of creator operators. True. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. I think, I mean, how, where would you put that, where would you put someone like a Cody Sanchez in that spectrum? She still, to me, is a creator operator. Yeah. Um, but I think she's she has a little more percentage on creator. Right. Right. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, I, it seems like a lot of stuff does funnel to her email list. Yes. Um. And you know, she, she, I'm sure she's gotten some back end there. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 still to me. I think. I guess yeah. when I when I step back, like I, I I still feel like the void is still massive on the amount of. Um, I'd say businesses who are not doing content or mm-hmm. or have an opportunity to but are not touching it. So like I I I I I'm like a huge advocate for 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 more and more people to like I'd rather it swing that way where it's yeah. like more and more people are trying to make content and and figure out a way to uh carve a you know audience or distribution advantage for themselves for the next, you know, 3 4 5 years and you know, use that to drive the business and have like a team that can support them on the actual execution side. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap for for this one. Maybe we'll we should do more. It's been great. But where where can people find out more about your agency and more and find out more about you? Yeah. Um if you go to RyanHashimi.com, that is a placeholder. Like we're building out the actual agency uh website in the next month or two. But RyanHashimi.com is uh is where folks can go for now and follow me on Twitter because I, I do a lot of breakdowns on on businesses, entrepreneurs, how they leverage YouTube to to actually scale their business the right way. Um, and so, yeah, I, I plan on putting out a lot more content this year. So just follow me and, uh, yeah, hope hope people get value from it. All right, Ryan. Thanks cool. so much for doing yeah, this. Yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me.